Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the outpouring of your healing power in this place, at this time, in this hour, in this old town. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Well, glory. Glory, glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Somebody's having problems with their heart. I keep getting just uh, uh, neurological problems. Some, something wrong with a nerve. Or, anybody know what that is? Who is that? A nerve problem of some kind. That's you? Come on up here. Let me pray for you. Can you do that? Amen. Anybody else? Jump in on that one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Whew. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for my dear sister. Thank you for bringing healing to her body. Bringing healing to her body. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that which was purchased on Calvary's tree, manifest throughout her from the top of her head to the tips of her toes. Thank you, Father God, for healing rain. Pouring down. Pouring down. Pouring down. <laughs> Pouring down. Pouring down. Pouring down. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for healing my sis. In Jesus' name. Ha ha. Oh Robo Koshika Talama Safrabo Koshika Telibas Defe. Thank you, Father, for healing my brother in Jesus' name. Oh Robo Koshika de Bumbro on the Libiz Defe. Thank you, Lord. Healing, healing, healing. Ha ha. There it comes right there. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Lift your hands up a little bit and just worship him. Thank you for his goodness in this place. Robert, don't sit down. Come here. Every time I look at you this morning, the Lord said, I need to lay my hand on you. Is that all right with you? Oh, Robo Kondelibes, Devro Monko de Lobo Shokotalibas Tefe. Oh, Roba Kadala, ha ha ha. Umbro Kotolobo Sheketelibes Defe. Oh, Roba Ha Sheketelibes Defe. Oh, Robo Koshikatalama Safa. I keep hearing this word. Uh, this young man uh, is a symbol of the first fruits of a new generation who are hungry for the real thing hungry for the manifestation of the Spirit of God, faithful to the Word of God, and desirous of the things of God. The beginnings, the beginnings, the beginnings, the first fruits of another generational shift, not away from the power of God, but back to the things of God in new vessels. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, Robo Koshika Talaba Safa. Oh, Robo Koshika Talama Sifi. Bless you, Jesus. 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 Oh, we thank you. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, glory. Glory, glory. Glory, glory. Ha, ha. Can I pray for you, Josh? Stand up here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Ha, ha. Oh, robo koshinga da bro. Oh, robo hoseke. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for my brother who walks in the heritage of faith, who walks in the things of God. Oh, thank you, Father that you're closing the gates where some things have escaped. <laughs> you're closing the gates where some things have escaped. 
and you're opening the doors oh, to new roads, new roads, new roads, higher plane, higher plane, higher plane. Not sidetracked anymore, but walking on a higher plane. Thank you, Lord. Praise you for it. Thank you, Lord. Praise you for it. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless His holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ha, ha, ha. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Well, glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, glory. Amen, amen, amen. Now maybe I can think to do what I'm doing here. Now. Get that out of my heart. Amen. Well, glory to God. He's turning it up. He's turning it up. He's turning it up. Amen. Glory to God. And he seems to be throwing my car keys on the floor. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. Whew. Glory. Glory. Today. Today, we're not waiting for a revival. We're having one today. Amen. We'll have another one tomorrow because tomorrow it'll be today again. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you grateful for His goodness to us through the years? Amen. And He's not quitting. He's moving on. Amen. He never changes. He keeps rolling. It's just a question of whether we roll with Him or not. Hallelujah. Well, I can't get off that subject, so I'm going to go back to it. Uh, I, 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 uh, I've been reading for I don't know how long now about how, you know, dull the, uh, uh, the millennial generation is. That's, uh, that's people that, were, that came of age, basically, somewhere around the turn of the century. You know, came into their beginnings of adulthood and life somewhere in the beginnings of the 2000s. And so we've now, for, t for 15 years, been uh, trying to research and figure out what to do with the millennial generation. Heck, they're all middle-aged now. We need, to be, we need to be thinking about whether some of the folks that are in the millennial generation are going to have anything to pass on to whatever this new generation is going to be called. You know, I, I was thinking about it the other day. We were uh, getting organized for our Club 57 to start up the 1st of March for our 5th through 7th graders. Amen. How many 5th through 7th graders we got in the house this morning? I know we got Mira. Who's in that crowd? Who's in that? Would y'all come on up here? Hi, Austin. Come on, man. Come up here. Bring Danny with you. Come on, Mira. Who else is here? Praise God. Oh, God, we got all kind of folks here. Amen. Now think about these kids. Amen. Amen. Come on. You're all right. Come over here. Come over here. The, the light's brighter over here. We want a spotlight on you. Amen. Look at these precious young folks, would you? Amen. Right. This is a. Uh, this is a crowd here. I don't know what they're going to call this generation. Do you? I mean, they call they what did they call me a baby boomer? Because after World War II, there was a sudden uh, uptick in the birth rate. Amen. When folks got back from overseas, praise God. And so uh, in the 40s, there boomed some babies into the 50s. And then uh, I'm not sure what they called the. There, there was a Generation X in there somewhere, and then a. I think the, uh, the, the Generation Y, uh, I think, is that the Millennials? I lost track. But, but here's the deal. Th these kids here were born uh, basically in this century. Think about that for a minute. I didn't think there was going to be a this century. <laughs> when I was their age, the idea that we'd, anybody would be here in the year 2000 was just crazy. It was a long time. And now here we are. These folks are on the verge of growing into... Uh, Adults. This is the generation we got to reach with the real power of God and the genuine Word of God. Amen. To help feed the hunger that's in them and don't let the little light that flickers in them go out. Keep the flame burning. Amen. And we're going to see a generation, Father. I believe. I'm going to pray for them. Can I pray for them? Y'all want to help me? Amen. Father God, I thank you for these precious, precious young people. I thank you, Father God, that you're forming them, that you bend the tree. Father God, into a shape so that it grows straight and erect. We bend the tree, bend the twig, bend the twig, so that that twig grows 
into a strong, strong, and fruitful tree. We thank you and we praise you for it. Father God, give us grace. Give us grace to recognize the gifts and the callings in these young lives and to nurture them into fruition so that there will be a day when they stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, and the devil trembles at the word, and all heaven rejoices because there's a new generation full of power, full of love, full of the word of God. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all can sit down. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. They did real good. They stood still. That's pretty good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know what they're going to call this new generation, but whatever they're going to call them uh, is uh, what's more relevant is what are they going to be filled with, what are their lives going to look like. Amen. Amen. We live in an odd day, dear friends. A very odd day. The thing that struck me this morning as I was praying, this is somewhere in my notes, I'm sure, uh, was that we've, we've uh, all of those different names for generations, you realize who made that stuff up, don't you? Advertising firms. Because they, they uh, first of all, uh, try to figure out a way to twist the minds and the desires of young kids, and then they uh, fashion products and advertisements to fit what they've created as perceived need in the kids. Amen. And then they try to tell them who they are. You're this way because you were born in 1990, and you're this way because you were born in 2000. Amen. I was reading the all of that and, and, and where the names came from and the sociologists that had helped the advertising people to, to come up with those concepts so that they could sell bubble gum. And uh, if that was the worst thing they sold, we'd be in good shape. They've sold uh, several bills of goods. Amen. But uh, I was thinking about uh, when I was coming up, you know, uh, we were, I remember in the uh, the early 50s when the first person on our block got a TV. Amen. Lived two doors down from us and we would go over there one night a week to watch the Lone Ranger. <laughs> I owe silver away. Amen. Our work is done here, Tonto. <laughs> Come on. Amen. It was a big deal. Family's name was Middleton. And we would go sit in their living room and watch The Lone Ranger. It was a big deal. And then eventually we got our own TV. The, the screen looked like a fishbowl, about this big around. Great old big cabinet and a screen about this big. Amen. <laughs> round. Amen. Amen. Made by Zenith. You had to have a, a, a wheelbarrow to carry the tubes back and forth to keep that baby running. Remember that? And, uh, amen. But, uh, and my dad would sit and we watched the Friday night fights. Look sharp and be sharp too. <laughs> Gillette razors, amen. Anyway, uh, my point is this. Uh, we grew up in, in, the, in the first generation that was really inundated with electronic advertising. I mean, the previous generation had radios, all right. Uh, I mean, my grandmother used to sit around and, and listen to the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday night. In the living room, everybody would sit look at the radio and tap their foot. But the, that was, we thought we was having a big time. But, the, but, the, uh, but here's the thing. In all of those situations, there was a, uh, in, in that generation, we, we had the electronics and the advertising, et cetera, but, you know, we all sat around the thing together. Amen. And if something came on the TV that my mama didn't think was appropriate, that was the end of that deal right there. Amen. That plug can be yanked, you understand, young man. Amen. We live now in a generation where people are disconnected. They're connected to little boxes they carry in their pocket. Amen. And uh, so it, we, we have to think in terms of how that affects the way they view life in general and try to plug in. But, but what we can do most, I believe, is try to provide a genuine family for them. Are you listening to me? 
I love the fact that we have a, a place where we can come in, get some coffee, sit down, chat with each other. Absolutely do. But I think it would behoove us. I don't know about you, but, but uh, when I was back in the 50s, I used to go to my grandma's in the summertime. She ran a bar, and her house was connected to the back of the bar. So you just walk out of the kitchen of the house, you'd be in the kitchen of the, of the, of the bar. And uh, on the house, there was a porch that went all the way across the front of the house. And there was a porch swing and some rocking chairs. Amen. And uh, we would sit out there in the evening, and as the sun was going down, and drink iced tea and uh, tell stories. The old people, the young people, the middle people, everybody, all the people sat on the front porch and uh, listened to Uncle Charlie tell tales and wave his cigar in the air. You know. Amen. <laughs> So we learned from the previous generation that we, we had actual contact with them. Amen. That's not so much anymore. But I believe people hunger for that stuff. It dawned on me a few years ago when I saw a bunch of men my age running around with their shirt tail hanging out trying to pretend they were 21. <laughs> I thought, that's just so silly it hurts. Amen. Put on clothes like a man. Amen. Quit trying to act like you're a teenager. You're not a teenager. Grow up. Amen. So then I decided, if I want to wear a suit on Sunday, bless God, I'll wear a suit on Sunday. Amen. Look like a man. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I, 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 it dawned on me that I didn't think my teenage friends wanted me to be one of them. They wanted me to be grandpa. Amen. <laughs> and that's okay. I don't smoke cigars, so I can't wave one around like my Uncle Charlie did, but... <laughs> but I can't wave my hand and tell stories. Amen. And do what? You pass on culture. Amen. And teach people how life works. I, I got news for you. If you're getting how life works off the evening news and, and the primetime TV and, and off your little doodad there where you're watching Hootube on there, uh, you're getting a warped perception of how life works. Amen. And the where are they going to learn if we don't make an opportunity to be with them? Hey, what do you mean? I mean, when you're sitting around it and you see young people going by, snatch one of them and talk to them. Amen. Really. Ask them questions. Let them talk to you. Are you listening to them? We refer to that as relationship. Amen. How do you pass on truth from one generation to the other? You don't just write them a letter. You have to sit with them. Come on. Amen. So uh, I believe in this day we're going to have a few folks that are hungry for the things of God who maybe don't have uh, that many birthdays yet. But we can raise them up in the things of God. Teach them how the flow of the Spirit goes. You know, they'll look different doing it than I do. That's okay but it'll be the same Holy Ghost. I mean, I suspect I probably look different from the Apostle Paul. Amen. I haven't worn sandals to work in years. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I have no idea why I'm on this today, but it's just burning in me today. Amen. You know what one sociologist said? This was in USA Today. Uh, said about this new generation coming up. I said the best name for it would be the pathetic generation. Because they don't know how to work. They don't know how to talk to people. And they think the world owes them a living. I said, you know what? I looked at this little line of folks up here this morning. I didn't see any of that. Amen. Amen. We're going to raise up a generation that's not going to be pathetic. They're going to be powerful. Are you listening to me? Amen. But it's on us to do it. Hallelujah. Well, glory. Seemed like I ought to preach something. So, y'all already paid for it. I guess I might as well serve the meal. John chapter 4. We've been talking about what the Lord's doing in this new year. Talking about turning it up. John 4.14. 4, Jesus said, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. Hallelujah. 
when the Lord asked us to start this church, He gave us a commission. He said, open a fountain of my healing power in this place. Amen. We knew He was talking about Tucson, Arizona. He wasn't talking about the, the room we were sitting in at the moment. He was talking about this town. And in the process of putting this together, uh, the uh, paradigm He gave us for doing that was by repairing broken people, preparing willing people, and making sure we celebrate the goodness of God. Amen. As I meditated on the concept of the fountain, this year the Lord spoke to me one simple phrase, clear as a bell, I'm turning it up. And so we've been talking about getting ready for the flow as it turns up. We've been talking about emphasizing removing obstacles and hindrances to the flow, natural and spiritual. We talked last week about the ministries of helps and how that helps the flow, repairing and building the structures that enable people to access the fountain. Amen. Uh, I pointed this out. I think that uh, the, uh, we can't heal anybody, and we don't even provide the water. But we can do the natural things necessary to make access easier to the pool. And uh, this week I want to just hammer on the, uh, the little uh, three-step word that Mrs. Harrison had for us in December when she was here talking about what's going to happen in this place she said it's going to expand folks and in that expansion you've got to stay together you've got to learn how to administrate the things of God here's the reality he's going to turn up the fountain he will do his part the question is Where's the water going to flow? As I was praying about it, thinking about it this week, uh, it just uh, I was uh, looking at pictures of, of rivers and streams and waterfalls and stuff. Amen. And when God says something to you, you ought to spend a little time with it, see what's going on with it. And uh, it dawned on me that water always flows to the path of least resistance. The water's going to flow. The question is, Who's going to let it? Come on. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but I want us to be the path of least resistance. Now, over the years, over the centuries even, uh, that's not always been the case with the church. Nearly every time done, God's done something really big in terms of revival, pouring out His Spirit on the earth, He's had to go outside the established church. Amen. Uh, you know, I came into the, to the things of God during the, the latter part, really, of the charismatic renewal. I came in in 79, and uh, the charismatic renewal started really in the 60s. But uh, God poured out His Spirit, filling people with the Holy Ghost, healing people, uh, having all that sort of stuff going on, but He couldn't get the, the denominational churches to pay any attention. So he just moved outside. He started filling Catholics with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Church I went to still arguing over whether Catholics were even Christians or not. Well, they were. Some of them still are. Amen. My advice to a lot of people in churches is get a life. Find something to do. <laughs> people are going to hell out there. Maybe we ought to be trying to help them. Amen. So uh, he moved through the Catholics. He moved through a, an organization of businessmen. Full gospel businessmen. Uh, amen. We're, we're responsible for huge inroads. People would get together. They couldn't get anything about the spirit and healing in their own denominational churches. So they'd meet outside the church. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Get people healed. And then sneak back to the church. You know, kind of like Nicodemus when he came to Jesus. That's what I was reminded me of. We know there's something going on over here. We see in the miracle. <laughs> Amen. And then go back, you know, to the synagogue. Well, they did that for a while. And then uh, about the time that I got in it, the uh, charismatic renewal had spawned some, some churches, some pretty nice churches and some Bible schools. People started planting charismatic teaching centers all over the world. Amen. To the place where there's a bunch of them out there now. That's really kind of the flow we came from right there. Amen. Amen. But uh, in this hour, the question is, are all the charismatic, word, spirit-filled, full gospel churches going to be sitting around arguing about 
whether it's grace or whether it's faith or whether it's works and whether or not they ought to have, you know, the, the gifts of the Spirit manifest in the service and, and the, should you talk. A, I mean, I've been to uh, meetings and got books and articles, you know, about how, well, you know, God's moving differently in this hour, you know, so we, we can't have the people speaking in tongues in the service, you know, and we, and we can't, God forbid we should have a healing line, you know, because it might offend somebody. And so they're all arguing about all of that. In the meantime, I'm wondering if God's not just going to move on and start another deal. I don't want Him to have to start another deal. Amen. I want the deal to be here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. If He's going to turn it up, I want this to be the place where there's no resistance to the flow. Are you listening to me? Glory to God. Why? Because people don't need another religious organization. There's plenty. If that's what you want is a religious organization to give you a set of rules and some place you can go to make your conscience feel better about the junk you did during the week, then we can refer you to some of those. But that's not what we're doing. If that's what we're going to do. I used to always tell my church, you know, you know, if I get tired of doing this, I could go get a real job, you know. But I'm not sure I can say that with a straight face anymore. There's nothing wrong with being a greeter at Walmart, but I don't want to be a greeter at Walmart. Amen. Amen. I, I always tell people, you know, I could go back to traveling. I believe, I, I honestly believe I could make a living traveling and preaching in other churches and telling them what they ought to be doing instead of trying to tell you. <laughs> Amen. People still invite me, and they get all excited about what we do overseas. I could, I could probably get them in the notion of supporting us even more than they already do. I mean, we get a pretty good amount of money. It just comes in because people like me. Amen. Come on, we do. <laughs> Pays for a large section of what we do in missions. Yeah, I, I tell you all that. You don't believe it's true. You keep the books, don't you? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, I think you know what. I just if we're not if we're not going to do it, then I'm just going to go somewhere and tell other people how to do it, and uh, go preach and go overseas where they appreciate it. But I believe we got a group here that appreciates it, don't you? I believe we got a group here that wants to keep the fountain gate open and let the river flow here in Tucson, Arizona, don't you? Glory to God. I want this to be the path of least resistance. When the fountain gets turned up, I want it to spew right here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Speaking of which, I don't know why that, what this has. Well, I do know what it has to do with it because it's an example of what I'm thinking. Last week we had a young couple here brought their three-month-old baby. Did you notice that at the end of the sermon? Uh, they, uh, they brought that baby specifically because they wanted me to pray for that baby because there was a really bad report. Uh, that, what was it called? I don't even remember what it was called. There was a little bulge in the spinal column. They saw a, a sack there. And the, they, so they thought the baby's got to maybe a, a, the, big, the edge of spina bifida, you know, something like that. And then they were going to do an MRI on Wednesday to determine where there was a, a hydrocephalus because of that the thing on the spinal column, they said that usually shows that there's some other weaknesses in the, in the uh, meninges, you know, and, and uh, so the brain quite probably is going to be swollen or there'll be places there where the, the, uh, the, the spinal fluid is bulging out. And so we, we want to, uh, you know, start treating this poor child for his hydrocephalus. So we're going to do an MRI on Wednesday. So, well, God bless the parents. They, they, uh, they went to Kenneth Copeland and found a church that uh, would be recommended from, uh, from them healing fanatics, you know. And... Uh, Brought the baby in here on Sunday, and we prayed for him at the end of the service. Praise God. Amen. And uh, we got the report this week. They took the baby to the MRI. They couldn't even find the original wound, much less anything else. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Sent the baby home, said no follow-up necessary. That baby's fine. Well, we, we knew that. <laughs> we could have told you that. Amen. Praise God. Here's my point. I, I don't know that those people will ever be back here. But I do know this, that they heard from somebody that if you need to get healed, this is a place where you can go get it. That's what I want. <laughs> That's what I want. Amen. I want, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the New Testament, it says the, the news of him was noised abroad. Glory to God. I want it to be noised abroad. There's something happening up there on that hill on Ironwood. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We want people to hear. There's a flow going on. Let's get somebody up there and get them healed. Praise God. Amen. We'll let God worry about the rest of it. So, 
uh, the, the charismatic renewal. I, I went back through all the, the uh, you know, clear back to the first great awakening back in the 1700s. Jonathan Edwards. What's his name? Whitfield. That whole crowd. Um, back in the 1710, 1720, 1730, along in there. Did you know that that great revival, did you know that the United States always talks about its great Christian heritage, but it was dead as a doornail. Amen. Uh, and the Puritans, you know, were very religious and uh, very uh, staid and, and uh, stodgy. They believed that your work saved you. And then these crazy Methodists came over and started preaching all this stuff. Amen. Do you know what there used to be? Fire baptized Methodists? Shouting Methodists. That's what I went to a nursing home up in upstate New York when I was pastoring up there. And this little old lady, she was pushing 100. And uh, I, I had a little service there. And, and uh, afterwards she said, you mind me of my granddaddy. He is a shouting Methodist. And he'd come home from church. And just dance around the living room and shout about Jesus. <laughs> a shouting method. I said, well, if I'm going to put you in mind of somebody, that sounds like a good person to put you in mind of right there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, glory. Amen. Well, uh, that great awakening happened, but, but basically the, the church wouldn't receive it. It, it. it flowed outside the established churches of the day. Same thing happened in England, you know. John Wesley had to take everything outside the church because the Anglicans were, uh, you know, they wanted all the angles to be 90 degrees. God wanted them 180. And the uh, second great awakening uh, came in the 1800s, early 1800s, Peter Cartwright and that whole crowd. They actually went out in the woods, set up uh, camp meetings out in a Brush Arbor meeting. Thousands of people came from miles around. For, they come for weeks at a time. Right, and, uh, and come on horseback and in covered wagons and just camp out. That's why they called them camp meetings. They were camping out. They had church all day, every day. Amen. But why? Because the established denominations didn't want any part of that insanity, you know. But you know what? The slaves that got freed because of that rock and revival, they were pretty happy about it. Amen. That's where the whole abolitionist movement came out of. Not to mention a large section of the uh, African American population got saved during the Second Great Awakening. Did you know that? That's where a lot of what we call the black church now uh, got its roots right there. Glory to God. Amen. Why? Because the established church wouldn't let any of those kind of folks in, you know. Hey, come on out to the camp meeting. We'll do it. Praise God. Amen. You know, contrary to what our... Uh, anyway, I won't go there. But uh, if it hadn't been for the real, live, born-again Christian people... There probably wouldn't have been a civil war. Everybody had just been civil. They weren't civil. They started standing up for stuff. Like the Holy Ghost get hold of you, you'll start, your mouth will open up, and you'll say things you wish you hadn't said a little later, but, but it'll make people, yeah, people stand up and listen. Amen. So, and then at the turn of the century of the last century, in 1900, um, what was that lady's name? Agnes something, wasn't it? They got filled with the Holy Ghost up there in Kansas, in Topeka. Charles Parham and that crowd. Uh, the whole uh, Pentecostal revival started where all the, the uh, Pente we, what we call Pentecostal denominations today came out of that. Eventually wound up over in Los Angeles at Azusa Street. Went from Kansas to Arkansas and then down to Texas and, and then William Seymour. Uh, a one-eyed black man got in the, in the meetings in Texas. He got so excited. When he got to Los Angeles, they rented a place called Azusa. And uh, started having church over there. And all the Church of God in Christ, the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostal Church of God, the United Pentecostal Assembly, all of those folks came out of that one little revival over in Los Angeles. Amen. Amen. And then back in the 40s, uh, a bunch of crazy people, Oral Roberts. And, amen. Amy Simple McPherson. There was a bunch of them during that time that got a, a, an insight concerning uh, the Holy Ghost and God's healing power. Started having meetings in tents all over the country, then all over the world. Had the great healing revival. Amen. Churches didn't want any part of it, so they had to put tents out in the, in the field. Amen. I, I don't want them to have to put a tent out in the field. If anybody's going to put a tent out in the field, I want to put a tent out in the field. <laughs> Amen. And let's have church. I mean, real church. 
not, not just sit in the pews and nod, church, but, sit, but let's, let's, let's dance on the pews. Let's jump over the pews. Let's turn handsprings over the pews. Why? Because if, if we got something real, it seems like we ought to get excited about it once in a while. Amen. I don't want any more nod to God religion. I either want a touch of God or let's go home. Hallelujah. Boy, I don't know what's the matter with me this morning, do you? Glory. You think a fellow would be tired. Last three weeks, last three weeks I've preached or taught uh, for uh, something in the neighborhood of 35 hours. Amen. But apparently I still got one more left in me. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, uh, Mrs. Harrison said this thing is going to expand, folks. But in order for that to happen, or at least for order for us to be part of it, we're going to have to be looking for it. Amen. When, when we're sitting out there having our coffee and talking to our little circle of friends, you know what they call that, don't you? Yeah. There you go. Somebody got it. Be careful. Invite somebody else into your clique. Amen. Why? Because if it's going to expand, then we've got to snag them. Come here. i got a cup of coffee for you, and I will tell you all these stories that everybody else already heard 13 times. Amen. Keep your eyes open and your head up. They're coming. Amen. Uh, let's befriend them. <laughs> Amen. You know, John chapter 4, in the 34th verse, it said, Jesus explained to his disciples, because they couldn't figure out what was going on. There was a revival going on. That's what was going on. He said, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me, and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. I love that sentence. Wake up and look around. Instead of having little seminars on why the church ain't growing and why the denominational church, why don't you wake up and look around. There's people dying out there looking for something real. And I, I know this, Sam, I don't mean this to be proper, but we got something real. This sucker works. Amen. He's a real Jesus, a real Holy Ghost. Amen. I don't want to cover it up. I want to proclaim it. Amen. Hallelujah. Wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Amen. We need to have a revival today, not plan and pray for the great one some way down the road. Let's have one today. People are going to hell today. Amen. The gospel is true today. Jesus is alive today. The Holy Ghost is on us in power today. Let's just have a revival. Today. Glory. Today. Amen. One of the things we're going to do this year is we're going to open a new uh, aspect of ministry, the Healing Fountain Ministry, where we can make healing available to the community in a much greater way. And we'll be talking more about that as we go. Remember at the tail end of last year, I taught the, the, uh, on healing for uh, forever. But... Uh, God's going to turn up that healing power in Tucson. I want to be part of the flood, don't you? Amen. And so we're going to do that. In order to do that, we have to commit ourselves to spending enough time on the mountain to pray down the power. And then we don't want to camp out on the mountain. We want to go down the hill and bring the power of God into contact with lost and broken humanity. Amen. I, I think the, the Pentecostals, you know, have always been in Peter's camp. When he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, and the glory of God came and God spoke and said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. And, and uh, uh, Peter's response was, whoo, it's good to be here. Let's build three tents and just stay up here on the mountain. That's been the Pentecostal way, you know. We're all going to get in the room where the glory of God will come. We'll dance around and carry on. Let's just stay here and enjoy the glory. No, Jesus said, we got to go down. Why? Because there's a boy that's bound by the devil down at the foot of the mountain. There in Mark chapter 9. Remember that? got down the mountain and the other disciples were, uh, they, they were uh, the denominational church. Nine of them stayed at the foot of the mountain. Jesus got down the mountain. You know what they were doing? They was arguing with the scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> Boys demon possessed, flopping around having seizure. They're theorizing about whether he could have a demon or not. <laughs> arguing with the scribes and Pharisees about how such a thing could be. Amen. They said when Jesus came down the mountain, they marveled at him. I think his face was still glowing. He looked at his disciples and he said, how long do I have to put up with you? Bring the boy to me. 
Amen. Why? Because they were down at the foot of the mountain arguing religion, got no power. Peter and the other two guys were up on top of the mountain in the middle of the power, but they don't want to come down because it's nasty down there. No, we got to go up the mountain, get the glory, and then bring it back down where people need it. Amen. We got to do both. Amen. We have to have those places of refreshing and renewal and training and equipping. But we also got to get out of here once in a while. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to do two things. We're going to take time on the mountain and we're going to train workers for the fields because they are white unto harvest. Glory to God. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Amen. We don't want that to be our fault, really. Amen. And then uh, she said, be prepared. It's going to expand. But then she said, you're going to have to stay together. Amen. You're going to have to stay together. That's one of the huge challenges whenever God starts doing something. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 4, 7 and 8 said, The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, everybody say most important of all. <laughs> well, that must be pretty important then, <laughs> you think? Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sin. Continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sin. Amen. I, I don't keep account. Judy will tell you I'm, I'm horrible. She used to think I was, there was something wrong with me because uh, I'd, I'd forgive people and that's the end of it. I don't think about it anymore. You know, I never kept an account. Amen. I finally learned that you could forgive people, but that didn't mean necessarily that you need to trust them. Amen. Because there's some people I forgave, I just took them back in like nothing ever happened, and they screwed me over again. I'm thinking, okay, third time's the charm. <laughs> I forgive you, but no, you can't do that anymore. Sorry. But love covers a multitude of sin. He said we've got to do two things if we're going to walk together. We're going to have to be disciplined in our prayers and show deep love for each other. I think it's interesting. He says, show deep love for each other. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. What's he saying? He said, you're going to have to just ignore some stuff. If, you're going to, if we're going to stay together, if we're going to commit together, everybody is not going to always do stuff that you like. Probably even me, as hard as that might be to believe. I was shocked when I got into ministry. Because I'm a pretty nice guy. I was a nice guy even when I was drinking most of the time when I wasn't stealing your stuff. <laughs> I mean, I was charming about stealing it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but uh, when I got into, I mean, when I had, I had secular jobs, you know, and I mean, you occasionally had a little difficulty with somebody, but, but uh, overall, you know, people liked me. And even the ones that got crossways with me, you know, we worked it out, you know. Amen. It was good. And then I got to pastoring. And people will say stuff like that. You really just thought that would be a good idea to say that, did you? I, I remember the, the first one that I remember really was shocking. My wife came to me. She was crying. We'd just taken this little church. They voted us in, for heaven's sake. Y'all ever hear about candidating for a church? Boy, that's a, just a, one of the rooms of hell right there. <laughs> that's the truth. My goodness gracious. Anyway, that means you preach and then they vote. Whether they like you or not. Whew. Mercy. Never again. Anyway. They voted us in, we think. And uh, so anyway, I'm there. And... Uh, one of the ladies in the church, I believe it was one of the, the head ladies, actually, arrested my wife in the hallway on the way back to the youth annex and uh, told her that everything was just fine here until the devil got here. Talking about me. Did he come run up and me crying? He called you the devil. <laughs> Amen. 
Now, but Judy, it wouldn't be a problem now. I mean, we'd have to pray for that poor lady. Amen. Your hide gets thicker over time, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Amen. I, I, I know John Caseman. Probably the easiest man to get along with in the whole world. I bet people have talked ugly about you. <laughs> Amen. I, I'm, you, you just wouldn't believe some of the things people. I had one man prophesy over me I was going to die. He was in charge of the prayer meeting for the church. Prophesied it in the prayer meeting with his hand on me. Say the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Haven't heard from him lately. I don't know which one of us is going to go first, you know. Amen. So my point is this, that uh, even if you think you're a wonderful person, people are going to do stuff that irritates you. Amen. Uh, Paul said that we wanted to uh, take care about people that bring division. Look in Titus chapter 3. Let's read the scripture just for fun. What do you think? Verse 9. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He said, Do not get involved in foolish discussions about spiritual pedigree. <laughs> There's a piece of good advice or in quarrels and fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. That eliminates most people's entire denomination right there. Doesn't it? Think about that for a minute. That was the thing. Cause, you see, I was a sinner before I was saved. I know that's a shock to you. But uh, I got saved in 1979. I filled with the Holy Ghost in April of 1980 and went to Rhema in September that same year. See, I still haven't been a member of a church yet. Really. And uh, I only had to fudge the truth a little bit on the application form to get into school because you had to have a pastor's recommendation. So I got the youth, youth pastor uh, from a, a, a Baptist church. He was an African-American fellow, a good friend of mine. And uh, he was ordained by the Baptists. And they told him that uh, he couldn't associate with me because I had glossolalia. <laughs> I said, yeah, but I'm, I'm taking antibiotics. It'll go away, you know. <laughs> no, glossolalia means I speak in tongues. That's a, if you ever hear anybody say that, that's what that means. <laughs> yeah, but he, he wasn't allowed to, to associate with people that spoke in tongues. But we worked together, so he had much choice. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I told him, I said, I need a pastor to recommend me to go to Bible school. He said, he said well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write you a recommendation. And if I get thrown out of the Baptist, I'll just get thrown out. He said, because uh, I can't imagine getting upset over something that seems to have changed somebody's life as much as it has you. Amen, because he knew me before and after. And he said, something happened, brother. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But... So he wrote me the recommendation. I got in. But uh, I got out of Bible school. I still haven't been a member of a church. And so uh, we went to the church. My wife had met this man in Oklahoma City who said he'd marry us. So we got married uh, by this pastor. And so when I got out of my first year of Bible school, we went there. And I just showed up at the door and said, whatever you need done, I'll do it. It's my entry to the ministry. So I cleaned bathrooms and, and filled the baptistry and did all that fun stuff. But uh, the thing that was shocking to me, well, the, I, I got my first big ministerial opportunity because we were sitting in the office with the pastor, and the pastor's wife came into the office bawling like a baby and crying, I mean, just sobbing. What happened? Well, she was teaching the ladies' Bible study when one of the ladies, I think it was probably the same one that called me the devil, started arguing with her, and, <laughs> and they got in a big fight, and the ladies' Bible study disintegrated right there on the spot. Well, the pastor's wife comes in, she's just bawling, squalling, you know, told me all the things that this woman had said, told all of us. And so that's how I got my start 
I volunteered to teach the ladies' Bible study. Well, I did. And it grew. Amen. So we opened the door to everybody after that. People, all kind of people started coming. Amen. Amen. But I thought, what in the world is going on here? That people would say such unkind things. In the Bible says, I mean, it's one thing to stand in the bathroom and gossip, but just right to people's face. You know? That's just evil. Are you listening to me? That's just mean. Ain't no use in just being mean. But I discovered church people are the meanest people in the world. Well, because you see, in church, if somebody said something like that to me out in the world, they'd only do it once. Are we going to fight? In church, they know you can't hit them. So they just say stuff. Amen. Amen. In the, uh, we were in that church. Judy will vouch for this one. It was on a Saturday night. I was meeting with the head elder. He and I had got crossways with each other pretty bad. And uh, uh, we had a meeting. And we sat down and we sat. I'm telling you, our noses were this close to each other. He's telling me off and I'm telling him off. <laughs> and it got pretty heated, you know. And uh, I said, you know what? I was making a living before I met you, and I'll be making a living after you're gone. I don't need you. He thought I needed him, you know, because he provided a large chunk of money. Amen. He resigned the next day. And left. But Judy said when it was over, she said, I thought she was going to hit him. I said, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> that was my full intent. <laughs> My point is this, that uh, uh, when God starts moving in the church, the devil just goes, okay, well, they're doing good now. What does he do? He comes and tries to irritate us with one another. Why? Because division and disunity, dear friends, saps the power. Why, there's power in agreement. That doesn't mean we're all going to be uniform, but we are going to be unified. There's a difference. Hallelujah. Why? Because we learn that love covers the multitude of sin. So we don't argue about useless stuff. Verse 10 says, If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. My, my, my. You see, strife keeps us from hearing all that God has for us. 1 Corinthians 3, he said in verse 1, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive, and even now you're still not able, for you're still carnal. For where there's strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Amen. When we get into strife and division with our brothers and sisters who've committed uh, to the same vision, to the same cause, and been planted in the same house, when that happens, what is that a sign of? Carnality. But it stops revelation. Come on. That means that the pastor, some things he can't teach. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 5. Let's look there right quick. Y'all doing all right? Well, I'm so far off that no even use even trying to catch up now. Glory. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to start in the 8th verse just for fun. But let us who are of the day be sober. We could start there. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with Him. That's all good news, isn't it? Y'all believe that so far? All right. Therefore, that is, if you believe all of that, then here's what you should do. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as we also are doing. Just as you also are doing, sorry. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. 
Those two verses have always blessed me because it tells you a whole lot about the role of everybody involved. It talks about those who are over you and the Lord. He says there's some things they ought to be doing. They ought to be admonishing you in the things of God. Amen. And they ought to be laboring among you. Not just mailing it in, but laboring among you. But he says to the congregation, recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. But you know that God sets people over us and talks about submission. Why? Because submission to authority is the cure for strife. Amen. Amen. We can disagree about a lot of things and still be in love with one another. But there are some things that are just absolutely non-negotiable. Amen. And somebody in the pecking order gets to make that decision. Are you listening? Amen. So we submit ourselves to the authority that God placed us under. That's the way that is. Why? Because that way we all flow together in unity. We don't have to worry about everybody's opinion about the subject. And then he said, recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. One translation says no. It's the Greek word aido. It means to look, up, look real closely at and see the very nature of, to inspect closely. You should know, if you're going to be a part of this church, that, that uh, you have some confidence that uh, I'm okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm perfect, but uh, I spend a lot of days trying to be. You know what I'm saying? I'm at least shooting in that direction. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, when he says no, it also means recognize. What's that mean? That once God, you realize that's where God has placed you, you need to acknowledge, yeah, that's my pastor. That's the church. That's the spiritual authority where God has set me. Amen. Recognize those who God has set over you in the church. It's an acknowledgement of God's order and flow in that area. And then he says, they teach you and admonish you in the Lord. Amen. Admonish is one of those words we don't use a lot anymore. But it means to put truth in your mind. That's literally what the word means. Nutheteo means to put something in your mind. Glory to God. Well, I'm working at it anyway. Recognize those who labor among you. Esteem them very highly in love. Notice this. Not because I'm so sweet, but for the work's sake. For the work's sake. There are some things that we just decide, you know what, I'm not going to worry about that. Why? Because the work's too important. I said the work's too important. Amen. Amen. Somebody told me I smelled good this morning. That's nice. But you know, I'd still be your pastor if I smelled bad. Amen. Amen. Trust me, as long as Judy's alive, I'm not getting out of the house smelling bad, so that's okay. <laughs> don't have to worry about that too much. Amen. And, and as a general rule, my tie will match my shirt, all right? So, as long as the lights are working and she's awake, we'll be all right. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, there's some just natural stuff and, and things we may not uh, be in 100% accord about from a natural standpoint but in the flow of the things of the church we want to esteem those who are over us in the Lord very highly in love why because the work is just too important amen the work of the local church dear friends is just too important amen and then he said I, I love the last phrase here's the one I was going for all along and be at peace among yourselves. You want to really be a blessing to your pastor? Be at peace among yourselves. I said, you want to really be a blessing to your pastor? <laughs> be at peace among yourselves. Amen. Love one another deeply and allow that love to cover a multitude of sin. Amen. Amen. Why? For the work's sake. For the work's sake. Hallelujah. So, I believe the biggest danger to any church is always division. Amen. Don't let it happen. God's been too good to us for us to let it happen. Note the questionnaire in Philippians chapter 2. Paul writing to the church at Philippi, whom he loved very much. He said, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Can I answer that question? Is there any encouragement in Christ? Yeah. 
Amen. Is there any comfort from His love? You think? Anybody derive comfort from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, okay. Then the answer to that would be yes. Is there any fellowship together in the Spirit? Is there a oneness in the Spirit that we enjoy? Yes. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Now we got two yeses on that one. That would be a good place to stop if you can't say yes to that question. We have identified the problem. Really? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? I'm going to say it again. Are your hearts... Well, let's, let's, let's take the S off the word. Is your heart tender and compassionate? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Close your eyes and bow your heads for just a minute. I want you to just let the Holy Ghost work on your heart for a minute. If you couldn't honestly answer tender and compassionate, if you couldn't say yes to that question, then uh, I want you to just let him do a little surgery right now. Lord, we want to be tender and compassionate. As soon as you can say yes to that question, just lift your hands up and begin to worship Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for tender and compassionate heart. Tender and compassionate hearts. Yes, there is a fellowship in the Spirit. Yes, we're comforted by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there's great encouragement and hope in belonging to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, yes. Lord, we want our hearts to be tender and compassionate toward you, tender toward you, and compassionate toward your people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, you are one who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You're our great high priest. Our desire this day is that we would be able to be touched with the feelings of the infirmities of our brothers and sisters and be compassionate. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then I'm going to pray for us the prayer that I pray for you guys and for a bunch of other preachers around the world. Paul said, if those things are true, then make me truly happy by agreeing, agreeing wholeheartedly with one another, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Father, I thank you for this people in this house in this hour that nothing will be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, that each of us will esteem others as better than ourselves, looking not only on our own things, but every one of us also on the things of others. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that we're capable of humbling ourselves and allowing ourselves to put others first for the good of the work of the kingdom of God. Thank you, Father, and praise you that you would let flow in us the mind, the attitude, the heart, the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ for one another. We thank you for that. Thank you for that. And as we do that, Father God, that strife and vain glory has no place among us. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. We praise you. And we thank you for it. Hallelujah. Stand up. Thank you, Jesus.
گور رو بکشی که تو نیستی گور رو بکشی که تو نیستی آه جیزوس I need you My closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. I love you. I need you, oh, Jesus. I'll never let you go, my Savior. My closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. With your heads bowed for just a moment. Maybe you came today and you've never made a first step of telling Jesus that you love him and making a commitment to that I'll never let you go aspect of Christianity. Not just acknowledging the doctrinal statement, saying yes Lord you're Lord and I will follow you Jesus is my Lord you've never taken that bold step and you need to do that today I want to pray with you before we go you need to acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord of your life today would you lift your hand and wave at me right quickly as I look around the room mm, mm, mm. Hallelujah. Well, okay. I'm going to just spit it out. The Lord said that there's uh, uh, some folks here who have backed off from the things of God. Not just going back into the world, but backed up from the service of the Lord, from the work of the Lord, from fellowship with God's people, and from their fervency that they once held because they got their feelings hurt by different folks in the church situations that didn't go the way they thought they were going to go. And so you're just guarded and shy about those things. I believe the Lord said today. 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 Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to let your heart be cleansed, to be tender-hearted and compassionate and to let your fire rekindle. Heads bowed for just a moment. If that's you, if you know you've backed up because you've got your feelings hurt over something and you're just, uh, it's hard to trust other people. If that's you and you know that it's you, lift your hand and wave at me right quick. I want to pray for you before we go. Amen. 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 I see him. I see him. Praise God. I see him. Amen. Let's all just grab hands with one another, can we? Begin to pray for the people next to you. Pray for them, Father God. Pray for them to ask the Father uh, to give them a heart that's after the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, heal up the places in us where we've allowed ourselves to take offense, where we've allowed ourselves to back up a step from the things of God. Oh, thank you, Father. Oh, Robokoshike, you lay this step. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Robokundo, Robokoshike, you brought us. Oh, Robokote, you lay this step. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you. We praise you, Jesus. And we thank you. Oh, Robokoshike, you lay this step. Oh, Robokoshike. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Robokoshi. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's sing that song from the top. Lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay set my feet upon the rock now I know I 
Jesus, 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 thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're our closest friend, and that you've placed us in a fellowship with friends that we can walk together with, brothers and sisters in the family of God. Thank you, Father, that the mind of Christ abides among us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.